This episode is brought to you by Tegas, the modern research platform for leading investors. Tired of running your own expert calls to get up to speed on a company? Tegas lets you ramp faster and find answers to critical questions more efficiently than any alternative method. The gold standard for research, the Tegas platform delivers unmatched access to timely, qualitative insights through the largest and most differentiated expert call transcript database. With over 60,000 transcripts spanning 22,000 public and private companies, investors can accelerate their fundamental research process by discovering highly differentiated and reliable insights that can't be found anywhere else in the market. As a listener, drive your next investment thesis forward with Tegas for free at tegas.co slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers, or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Zach Buss, an investor at Irenic Capital, and today we are breaking down the Coca-Cola company. Coke began in 1886 and now offers a wide-ranging portfolio, including its namesake Coca-Cola, but including sparkling water, sports drinks, coffee, teas, and juices. The company's beverage products are made available to consumers throughout the world through the company's carefully constructed network of independent bottling partners, distributors, wholesalers, and retailers. On May 8, 1886, Dr. John Pemberton brought this perfected syrup to Jacob's Pharmacy in downtown Atlanta, where the first glass of Coca-Cola was poured for five cents a glass. Today, more than 1.9 billion servings per day of Coca-Cola are served worldwide. To break down Coca-Cola, I'm joined by Freddie Late, founder and managing partner at Latitude Investment Management. We cover the business of Coca-Cola and how its bottling network is imperative to its capital light business model. We discuss recent acquisitions like Costa Coffee and Body Armor, capital allocation, and the Coca-Cola company's expansion beyond its flagship brands and products. Today, the business is focused on its strategy as a total beverage company, leveraging its distribution, marketing, and production capabilities to streamline its portfolio from 400 to 200 brands, with Legacy Cope representing just 50% of their offering. Now, please enjoy this conversation on the Coca-Cola company. All right, Freddie. Thank you for joining us to break down the Coca-Cola company. Last time you joined us, you put on an absolute clinic on AutoZone. I hope we can live up to that. I think to start, despite the fact that this business is internationally recognized and appreciated, I don't think people actually understand the actual business model to the extent that they should. Maybe just start out with size and scope and how we should think about the business. Great to speak with you guys again. Everyone knows Coca-Cola. It's one of the most well-recognized brands in the world. What we'll get into today is they have a very different business model. And they've basically created this model by accident and then deliberately over the last 50 to 100 years. That's resulted in them being, depending on how you calculate it, by far and away the largest consumer stable company in the world with the single most valuable consumer brand and the largest amount of operating profit out of any of the companies that we look at. And to give you a sense of the scope, They have 26 individual billion dollar brands within the business. While Coca-Cola is still the dominant brand by a long way, they do have a number of other businesses that in their own right could constitute a decent business. They astoundingly sell 2.2 billion servings of their drinks every day. And they sell in all but two countries in the world, which I think are Cuba and North Korea. So the reach of this business and the scale and the brand recognition is the culmination in a kind of nearly 150 years work. And there's a huge amount to go for. People think of it as a very mature category. They think of it as X growth, but actually it's carried on growing unit volumes pretty much consistently at around 3% for the last 50, 60 years. And there's plenty of reasons for that. So I think there's a lot to unpack in durability of the growth within the business, as well as the competitive advantages. 
And I think the scope of the business is just unparalleled. And when you look at the competitors, they're paling in insignificance and actually losing value share to the Coke system. So it is one that's worth anyone who's clicked on the link to listen to the whole story, because there's been a lot of change in the last 20 years. And the last five to 10 years of financials do not do justice to the value creation that the business has delivered. So I think that's really the key bit we'll unpick today is despite earnings growth being anemic and the reordering of the business and lots of restructuring costs, how have they genuinely demonstrated value creation and what are the next 10 or 20 years look like? And so maybe to kind of set the stage, there are other very prominent beverage businesses that operate globally, Pepsi Corporation, Monster Energy, Keurig Dr. Pepper, I can go for a while. What is it that kind of differentiates this business from a size perspective? How much bigger is it than its peer set? When you calculate the Coca-Cola company's revenues, it misses the point slightly. So the way the business is constructed in the way they call it the system, they have basically outsourced the bottling and ultimate distribution of their beverages. And Pepsi's done this to a degree too, so it's Curry Dr. Pepper in a small way. But this franchising of the bottling and distribution assets results in somewhat confusion because we have to talk about either system sales or Coca-Cola company, which is really a franchise revenue. But if you look at system sales, which is the comparable number to Pepsi or other businesses, the business is twice the size of Pepsi in terms of operating income. And PepsiCo, over 50% of that operating income comes from snacks and salty treats. Of the beverages, it's four times the scale of its nearest competitor. The other major competitors, there's drinks brands contained within Nestle or Unilever. Kerry Dr. Pepper is 50% a competitor and then 50% coffee, which is slightly different but they pale in insignificance, a tenth of the size. The system sales are nearly 150 billion. That's the kind of wholesale sales through the Coca-Cola company and its bosslers. And that's pretty much unsurpassed by any other beverage company, however you cut it. And so we'll delve into the intricacies of their global network and bottling and distribution system. But I think maybe to help frame it, let's go through kind of the history of the business and I know it's gone through its different evolutions and its go-to-market strategy and brand strategy, but bring us to where we are today. I'll split it into two parts because the history is incredibly long and distinguished. Obviously, it was founded in the late 1800s and they built the business in North America particularly, but actually through the wars, they distributed bottling plants into Europe and began their international expansion 70 years ago. They grew as the dominant franchise marketing business. They really invented a number of different brand and marketing initiatives. You know, they were the first to come out with the unique bottle shape. They're credited with at least giving the color to Santa Claus, if not creating him in the first instance. They were the first ones to launch a diet product in the 60s called Tab. The business was a very, very successful business all the way through the early years, the first 50 years of last century. It was growing. And then as the sort of post-war period and consumerism really took off, they captured an enormous amount of share. They bought into Minute Maid and they expanded their beverage offering into juices and they launched Diet Coke in 1982, which was an extraordinary success. They were basically the dominant brand, I believe in 2000, when the long history ends in this story, they were the most valuable brand in the world. Through that period, there were two major concerns for the business. The first one was the Cola Wars, the Pepsi Wars that I grew up with as a child. Basically, Pepsi ran this series of sort of taste the difference, blind tasting. And it turned out that everyone preferred the taste of Pepsi blind. And this is very important because what Coke tried to do in the 80s was actually reformulate the Coca-Cola formula, the famous secret formula. And when they launched a new one, there was a huge backlash and they had to cancel it nine months later. And it proved a point 40 years ago, but still very important today, which is it doesn't matter that it's the best product, the best cola. It matters that it's Coca-Cola because that marketing message and advertising had done such a powerful thing to live in the psyche of people who consumed it. And so from then on, they focused a lot more on marketing and distribution as opposed to on the product itself. They haven't launched a huge number of new variants or new products since then. It's been around building up that moat and they really won those wars in many ways. The second war, which is the most relevant, I think, was this combative nature with their bottlers. And it's a really important part of the system for people to understand that ever since Coke was first founded, 
other people have been bottling and selling the drink. And as a quirk of an appalling contract signed in the early 1900s, bottlers were able to buy the sort of raw ingredients from Coca-Cola at a fixed price. So as inflation came through and took off, the bottlers were making all the money and Coca-Cola wasn't. And so they had to go through a strong period of renegotiating all of those contracts. And there's been a lot of tension in the past. There've been periods where the system itself has been creaking. Off balance sheeting, the bottling and distribution assets resulted in Coca-Cola getting a bit greedy, trying to charge too much for the raw materials and lots of lawsuits through the sort of 70s and 80s. That was the problems that we faced as we came into 2000. What's happened since 2000 is a major reorganization of the business. And so Coca-Cola had basically decided that they were going to refranchise out an enormous number of these bottling plants in the earlier periods in order to get them back in shape and to reset the agreements. They brought them all back on balance sheet. And so a huge proportion of those bottling plants were brought back on balance sheet, reinvested in, had new capital stock, better systems. And a major, major piece of this was between sort of 2015, 2017, when they refranchised over 40% of the bottling assets. And so the story was one of great success for many, many decades, conflict within the system itself. And then a sort of 10 to 15 year period of sorting that out, which we are now 95% of the way through. And so that has resulted in a much better management between the two levels of the system, the external bottlers and the Coca-Cola company itself. And obviously the brand remains as relevant as ever. And actually since the pandemic has been growing in its relevance quite dramatically. And so I think it'd be helpful to just take a sidebar here and talk about why bottling and effectively managing a brand or different businesses. I think from a basic economics perspective, one is obviously more capital light than the other, but I think it'd be helpful to kind of set the stage for why you may be a great bottling business and why you may be a great brand building and distribution business and why you may not be both or may not want to be both from like an economics perspective. So there's the pure economics, as you say, the sort of financial returns are far higher for the Coca-Cola company than they are for their bottlers, closer to 30% return on investor capital at the moment and rising quite dramatically versus 10 to 15 for the bottlers around the world. That's one of the key reasons that the business wants to focus on marketing. But the second is really a circle of competence. It's that a local business managed with a long-term, they call them reference shareholders, but normally large family shareholder alongside the Coca-Cola company, and in some cases, public shareholders, these businesses are listed, allows for that local go-to-market knowledge, local innovation around the brands, and a greater understanding of tax size requirements, changes in the retail landscape, changes in regulation, changes in consumer taste, which not only benefits that region itself, so you have a much more acute go-to-market strategy run by the bottling plant in conjunction with the Coca-Cola company, but that information is also fed back. The model is that the Coca-Cola company still owns around 20% of most of these bottling assets. They sit on the board, they help direct, but they also take feedback from, which they can give back to the rest of the system. That's where many of their innovations have come from. That's where many of their best practices have come from, learning from the best bottlers in certain regions, and then taking that skill set and transferring it elsewhere. So there is clearly an argument from the financial perspective that you can operate a higher return on capital business like the Coca-Cola company, which is effectively a franchise ownership business that supports those franchisees with an extraordinary amount of marketing. 15% of Coca-Cola company sales are spent on marketing support direct for the bottlers, another 10% in brand advertising, but also to create this innovation that's bubbling up towards the center and then distribute from the center. The other role that the central company plays is adding new beverages to the portfolio and supporting that growth on a local and global basis. It's not purely a split operating company in a property and capital company business. Those models, which have been more prevalent in the last 20 years, interest rates have been falling. They're more of a kind of cost of capital arbitrage. This one's particularly interesting to us because it actually creates synergistic benefits for the group as a whole. I know a handful of these enterprises on the bottling side are also independently public. I know there's Coca-Cola FEMSA. I believe there's the ticker Coke in the US, which 
is often mistaken for the Coca-Cola company. Do you guys spend time investigating and understanding kind of those businesses in order to inform your view on the Coca-Cola company? There's quite a few that are listed, half a dozen or so. And so you can get pretty helpful bottom-up financials for the other half of the system and to understand how they're operating and where it's going. So we have looked at a lot of them. Some of them would make interesting investments in their own right as well. The key tension between the bottlers and Coca-Cola over time has been the price that they charge for what they call the concentrate, this syrup that they sell to the bottlers to which they add sugar and fizzy water and create the drinks. And that has tended to be in the sort of low 20s as a percentage of sales for those bottlers. And that creeps up over time as you're more mature. But what we need to believe is that the bottlers are healthy. They're investing back in their businesses and have great capital stock, great investment initiatives, and alignment with us as shareholders of Coca-Cola. So the first thing we assessed was, what are the average returns on capital in these businesses? Are they making an adequate return on capital? And are they getting the support they need from Coke? Because if they weren't making an adequate return, eventually that would be a cost for us. When you look through it, the average return on capital, and it's quite a widespread, but for the bottling assets is around 10 to 12%. And so that's an ample return. But particularly given that, about 30% on average of that invested capital calculation is a intangible asset for the fact that they own the right to distribute Coca-Cola. Now, that is obviously a very valuable asset. And in different regions, they calculate it different ways, but it's on their balance sheets as a perpetual intangible asset in many cases. So adjusting for that, their kind of cash return on cash invested capital, it's closer to 15% and in some cases, as high as 20 So actually, these businesses are doing very well at the current franchise B and are investing back in their businesses for growth. So that was the first point. They're healthy and they're growing and they're investing back in their businesses. And there may even be room for the Coca-Cola company to charge a little bit more for that concentrate over time. So that creates an incredible alignment of interest. And we have that system that's going to be working. We do believe that over time, and you can look at in the more mature markets, Coca-Cola is already able to charge more for that concentrate. So it is likely over time that the average concentrate cost as a percentage of sales may drift up from sort of 21% to 23%. The other thing that I think is really critical is the concept of alignment. What's happened in the comments I made earlier about the breakdown in the two sides of the system was because Coca-Cola was really running a volume-based system. And that didn't align to value creation. And so they've moved to something, and there's quite a lot of terms you need to learn if you start analyzing Coca-Cola's annual reports 10Ks, but incidence-based pricing. And all this means is they're looking for value. So if they can sell smaller pack sizes or more convenient pack sizes that generates higher gross profit dollars, they should be doing that. And that aligns well with the bottlers. So effectively, they're on a revenue share now, which has created far smoother alignment. And that's even enshrined in quite a few of the shareholder agreements that they've struck with these independent bottlers. So you have better alignment. You have a very healthy bottling system that's reinvesting and generating decent returns for itself while growing. And you can believe that the tension has faded. And so now that we've kind of established the brand versus bottler dynamics, I want to speak more broadly about how this business grows and why growth has been so consistent. Clearly, they have pricing power over their bottlers in some ways, but I would suggest that the growth of the business has actually been a lot healthier than people perceive, given it's not just all price. There's plenty of volume growth in the system. How do they think about driving top line? When you think about the system as a whole, they refer to things called unit cases, which is just an equivalent of 24 cans of eight ounces. But unit case volumes has grown around 3% incredibly steadily for the last 10, 20 years. So volume has been coming through. Now, part of that's acquisition, part of that's brand extension, but these are things that they've proven themselves to be able to do. And actually, even Coca-Cola itself is still growing substantially around the world, as well as Diet Coke, not to mention Coke Zero, which is really the darling in the portfolio at the moment, growing 10% plus per year in terms of volume. On top of that, over the last 10, 15 years, while inflation has been quite low, they have averaged around 2 to 3% price, roughly inflationary pricing which I would anticipate remains in the future. So you've ended up achieving a kind of 5 to 6% system revenues growth, which is well in excess of the consumer staples peer group and in excess of certainly most of the large ones that we look at. 
that aren't special. It's grown very nicely and will continue to do so. The growth opportunities for the business, again, I mean, people talk about, well, surely it's X growth and can't move on from here. There's a number of growth opportunities that they're really pressing at the moment. The first one I would say that is slightly overlooked is the fact that there are $26 billion brands, all of which outside maybe Coke, Sprite and Fanta, which are the three most leading brands, all have room to grow. Some are recent additions to the portfolio, Body Armor or Fairlife, relatively recent additions to the portfolio like Innes Smoothies. But these businesses are growing far faster than the group and adding a lot to the top line. And the business has this phrase that they're trying to become a total beverage company, which means entering every category and dominating in the categories where they play. And so they've already done very well in juice with the Minute Maid acquisition years ago. They've done very well in water. They own vitamin water and glass. So they have some reasonably good energy assets. They missed a chance to invest in Monster and they have a joint venture with Monster, which has been highly accretive, but they didn't get to own Monster, Monster Beverages, but they do own Powerade. They have recently bought Body Armor and they've recently also moved into alcoholic drinks. They're launching cans of Gak and Coke. They've just signed another deal to do Absolute Vodka and Sprite. And they're testing and finding their way in the alcoholic category too. Not to mention Costa Coffee, which was an acquisition a few years ago. UK coffee business, very successful. Sales were up 3x or something like that in the 10 years prior to buying that business. What you end up with is a core business with decent volume growth, a lot of additional potential around the edges, and now a system and a central business that is totally aligned behind the revenue growth management and the value creation of each of those brands in a standalone basis. They actually cut their brands down from over 500 to 200 a couple of years ago in the spirit of trying to focus on these brands, really build them out individually. So the room for growth in terms of the potential from the underlying brand is very strong. And when you think about the demand side, how much more can we all drink of these sorts of drinks? There's two ways to look at it. If you look at the North American consumption per capita for the last 30 years, the market hasn't really risen much. Coke's been taking share and will probably continue to take share from Pepsi. It outspends Pepsi on a marketing basis, three to one, maybe even four or five to one actually these days if you exclude the snacks. So it's really dominant against its competitors. Elsewhere, in Latin America, for example, 20 years ago, the consumption per capita was half the level of North America. And as that economy has grown and population has grown, you've seen that rise all the way towards the North American average of 400 servings per year. And so you can see this potential for growth from the rest of the emerging markets and other regions, which at the moment, on average, are around a third of the level of consumption per capita that the Americas are. And so the potential for growth and for moving people into commercial beverage occasion, they call it, but the idea of not just drinking water at home, but buying a drink out for your fridge, is very likely over the next 10 to 20 years. We see the supply side, the brands that are winning and the market share that's being taken. We also see the demand side as economies evolve over the next 10 to 15 years. I must ask, given that just looking at the monster shareholder list, Coca-Cola is the largest holder with almost 20%. Is there a better, more interesting story behind that? Behind the story of why they own 20%? Yep. And how they kind of missed the opportunity to own more. I think at the time they had an existing brand and they felt the shares were overvalued. I do think it was as simple as that. And they've always been expensive, Monster. And, and look, the success that they've had has been extraordinary, partially down to the fact that through the ownership stake, they've been given access to the Coke distribution. There is no distribution network like the Coca-Cola distribution network on the planet. And if you manage a drink or invent a brand or come up with a brand and want to push a brand, it's the single best point of access. 30 million customers globally, 50% rise in the last decade in the number of customer outlets. And don't forget the customers are retail stores or concessions or restaurants. They're not us. We are one step away. I think it was a sense of valuation risk at the time. I mean, it's interesting you bring up the point because I think some of the most successful companies tend to dominate when it comes to distribution. You think of the likes of Microsoft and Apple and technology and their ability to push things through their system. The Coca-Cola company shares a comparable competitive advantage. What are the other components of this business that you think provide the defensibility that makes it so hard to challenge? A network effect created by the customer touch points ultimately being right in front of the customer at all times. 
in the Coca-Cola's systems model, that's also managed by local partners who understand those individual customers better than perhaps some global HQ can. And so it's not a one size fits all model, but yet still connected to the same system. So I do think that is the leading advantage that they've created and they've nurtured it the last 20 years. They've improved it dramatically and invested behind it enormously. The second one, which is a corollary to that really, but it's taken people a while to realize the benefit of this is the data and the insights and the analytics that you can get. So all of these bottlers are invested in systems similar to SAP's HANA or Microsoft Dynamics, and they're getting this real-time data and feedback on consumer changes, consumer behavior, which again, really informs their marketing spend, really informs their revenue growth management and their categories in different regions. And that's just one of the big benefits that comes from it. I think obviously you can't mention Coca-Cola without talking about the brand and the franchise value and the value of nurturing over a very long period of time that brand equity. It's probably one of the most recognized words in the world, certainly one of the most recognized symbols in the world, and it stands the test of time. I think the final one is really just their scale. As I said, they're outspending in terms of as a percentage of their sales, let alone in absolute dollars, the amount they spend on marketing and advertising globally. And really that's the lifeblood for consumer goods companies. And so building that out has been huge and it's all been led by this dominance in cola. Their Coca-Cola trademark Coke is such a cash cow and that has enabled them to buy these other businesses, sometimes highly successfully, sometimes with lower success, but to build up that kind of distribution network, to build up that brand portfolio and invest behind it. They're generating $10 billion free cash flow at the moment. It'll be 12 quite soon. Extraordinary amount of free cash flow to invest back in the business or obviously pay out its dividends. They tend to. You mentioned the robustness of the free cash flow that the business generates, given the capital light nature of it and its focus. How do they generally approach capital allocation from a value creation perspective? And where are they spending money and investing? The majority of the money is being spent by the bottlers. And just to be clear, there is still a line item in the accounts for Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola company called the Bottling Investment Group. And this still owns a couple of major bottling assets. 50% 50% are in Africa in a business called CCBA, 35% are in India with the remaining 15% already planned to be refranchised mostly in the Philippines. And so they do still own some of it, but the group spends seven or $8 billion a year on CapEx compared to the groups for Pepsi, it being something like one and a half, maybe a fifth on capital expenditure. But as those businesses get refranchised, the absolute CapEx number for the Coca-Cola company will fall to probably a billion dollars or less. They'll have very, very much a lower requirement for individual capex that will be done by the bottling assets. So the way they spend their money, predominantly, obviously it's capital light now, or it's moving towards it, it's on marketing. And that's where 85% of their OPEX sits, 30% operating expenses to sales, about 10% is spent on global brand advertising, sponsoring the Olympics, similar events to that. 15% is spent on direct support for these underlying bottlers, whether that's supporting cooler rollouts, new innovation, brand launch, brand activation. Once they have that free cash flow at the bottom, which is, you know, a very healthy 30, 35% EBIT margin at the moment, it's 30 at the moment, but it's going to move up to 35 post refranchising, we believe trending towards 40% margin. Most of that converts down to cash after taxes. And so... The predominant use of cash has been dividends. They bought back maybe 1% of shares a year, but they pay out about 75% of that free cash in dividends. They're very proud of their dividend. And actually these days, they're going to need even less capital to reinvest back in the central business than they have in the past 10 to 20 years. It's likely that the cash margin will be rising quite substantially in the next five years. The only other use for cash, I mean, they have a very unleveraged balance sheet. So the lower end of their 2 to 2.5% target at the moment going to tip down quite rapidly. I do expect to see more share buybacks and I expect to see the 75% ratio stable for the dividend. I don't believe they'll cut the dividend having maintained it or grown it for, I think, over 60 years. But I do believe they'll do more acquisitions. This is really the question around the business is where will they be buying in? How much success will they have with it? From the analysis we've done on the long term, it does seem to take a number of years for these new brands to settle into the Coca-Cola system and then to find their feet grow. 
And it's very hard to see how any of them can match Coke itself or even any of their other top five power plants. But that's the ambition and that's the plan. And coffee in particular has been such a successful category over the last 15, 20 years. It's great to see them with a good asset and they have a lot of potential runway with that asset in Costa Coffee. But I do expect we'll see more acquisitions across the piece. Touching on the broader brand portfolio, they kind of shrank to grow. They're now making kind of more, I don't want to say speculative, but growth-oriented investments in non-traditional categories like caffeinated beverage and alcoholic. Which of that portfolio do you tend to watch most closely? What's most interesting? What's worth talking about? They have a number of these things which are held in the division they call global ventures. And it's a little bit annoying because it's another complication to the accounts. But the majority of global ventures is really their ownership stake in Costa and soon to be fully incorporated into body armor. And it also includes innocent fair life. So there's quite a few to talk about, but I think the most exciting for us is the story with Costa and the potential for getting the kind of ready to drink and vending options available as well. So Costa is a restaurant chain. It's broadly comparable to a Starbucks. But the success they've had already in expanding that internationally has been very successful. And I think taking that internationally and following something like the Innocent Playbook, when they bought their majority stake in Innocent, over the next five or six years, they doubled the sales from that business purely by taking it into international markets and really activating that brand elsewhere. And so we expect that to be on the way at Costa. And not just through the physical store footprint, which is obviously something one was sort of hoping to get away from in the capital light store model. One of the great successes they've had in the UK, which again, they're rolling out elsewhere, is they're actually making very good coffee through vending machines. And so you'll see these in petrol stations or in airports or in hotels, and they've been taken up very, very rapidly as well. So the growth in Costa and coffee is exciting in its own right, but it's not a huge needle mover for the business. None of these are for the next five years. The most exciting outcome from that acquisition will be them successfully creating a ready-to-drink version, whether that's they've tried some kind of Coca-Cola infused with coffee or its own brand, a Costa ready-to-drink. I mean, they exist. They just haven't taken off yet. That seems to be a huge goal for a number of businesses around the world and on the Nestle and Starbucks, Cherry Dr. Pepper are all looking at as well. But I think if they compete in that, that would be huge. The other businesses, I mean, they're all around a billion of sales. They're all exciting. I think Body Armor goes a long way towards countering the Gatorade threat and other threats to their business, but it may prove to have been more defensive than a real revenue generator. And then Fair Life, I think it's going to be a bit early to tell dairy products are becoming increasingly popular, especially with healthy drinking and vegan lifestyles and people who go to the gym a lot and things like that. But again, it's still only a billion of sales. So in terms of getting excited about it moving the needle, it's all incremental. And these businesses can definitely contribute meaningfully to the top line, which is already steadily growing. And I think the same is true with alcohol. Right now, I think Jack and Coke could be a huge success. Absolute vodka and Sprite might take a little while to take up. And then I want to revisit the regional breakdown of the business. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that North America only constitutes about 50%. This really is a global company. How do you think about the different puts and takes when you consider their global footprint? You can get into a lot of weeds on the underlying capital allocation in these different regions. But the two most exciting markets are definitely India and China. Probably India is the most exciting for us. And it's notable that at the moment, They still own the bottling asset there, and they seem to be keen to hold on to those. It's a double-edged sword. Growing in the emerging markets is very, very plausible over the next 10 years. If the Indian economy evolves in any way as we expect it to, a huge number of consumers will basically enter the market for sparkling beverages and bottled water and all of the other drinks that they sell and serve in that region. And the price that they charge is still very low. So it's very, very easy for consumers in that market to adopt these products. And the brand is popular. The problem comes with the FX. And so the big discussion around what's driving revenues and how much that comes through in dollar profit is the really hard thing to answer. I'm firmly of the view that Coca-Cola will grow its market share and the market itself will grow rapidly in these emerging markets. 
the thing that they've had to prove, and they've done a really good job at in the last three to four years since this system had all clicked into place, is translating that into dollar profits. So thinking about their pricing algorithms in terms of the dollar value growth whilst operating in the local currency. The last 10 years, FX has hurt organic growth rates by 1% to 2% per year. I'm certainly old enough to remember an era where dollar didn't just go up and emerging market currencies rose, and that would be a wonderful turn of events for this and a few other consumer status companies that grow in those regions. But realistically, the way we think about the regions is this. North America had sort of capped out 10 to 15 years ago, and the volume wasn't growing as much in freight mark coat. And so the growth was coming from the other regions. What we saw in the pandemic was a really meaningful pickup in consumption and a reactivation of, with a number of households, the interest in the brands and particularly trademark Coke. So volume has been growing really quite nicely in North America. And that is still, as you say, 50% of the business. You can continue on a steady growth path that region whilst growing substantially in India, China and the other emerging markets. I mean, they're in 200 you should see sales growth easily at the top end of their four to six percent range. And that doesn't include any real addition for success in ready to drink coffee. Even their guidance doesn't include any alcoholic contribution. You could be talking about a business, even without major inflationary pressures, that's growing at seven plus percent top line. And so there'll always be puts and takes in the regions and there's always timing issues with FX and things like that. But we believe there is substantial growth to go for. And the way they calculate it, only about 10% of the developed markets are not captured in their addressable market, i.e. just don't buy beverage products. That number's around 65% in the developing markets. So as those economies grow, you can really treble the addressable market in those areas. The average serving of Coke costs something like 50 cents. It's a very accessible luxury treat, or maybe luxury is a strong word, but it's a very accessible thing if you are making a bit more money to start enjoying one of their many popular brands. I think you use the apt word treat. Clearly one of the overhangs on this business is the perception of obesity and the impact on health. So I must ask the obligatory question when it comes to risks, how are you thinking about it from general diet changes? And then as an extension of that, GLP-1s are having an impact on at least the trading multiples of all consumer staples and food-related businesses. And so I'd love to hear how you consider those risks in the context of the business's trajectory from here. The main way I'd frame this is most of the wheat periods in Coca-Cola's history have pretty much been of its own making. It's breakdown in relationships with bottlers, it's mis-execution on some brand, reformulating their own brand in the 80s. None of the marketing externalities, the threats to the markets in which they operate, have ever actually come to pass to hurt them from a volume perspective. And that's not to sound too complacent, and I'll address C- GLP-1s directly in a second, but they have grown unit case volume incredibly consistently through a huge number of changes in consumer appetites, the way we eat, eating in, eating out, eating at home, meal delivery kits. They have, by far and away, the highest penetration at 65% of all home deliveries. It's a Coke product, not a Pepsi or anyone else. So they've managed to adapt phenomenally well over the years to these changing environments. In relation to worries about diets and concerns, they launched Tab in the 60s, Diet Coke in the 80s, Coke Zero in the noughties. They've been addressing these problems and a large proportion of their drinks, I think it's 35% already, is already zero sugar. So there's defense against it. There's options for consumers who want the zero sugar options pretty much across all their brands, and they are growing faster. To address GLP-1 specifically, because you're right, it's hurt the share price to a number of consumer businesses in particular. We were shareholders in Novo for many years. We've actually recently exited from a valuation perspective. We look at GLP-1s a lot, and we've always known that these are truly wonder drugs. But I do think the actual impact that's going to be felt, even in a bull case as a Novo Nordisk shareholder, is going to be more muted than people think. And if you try and break it down simply, if you look at somewhere like the US, the percentage of the population that's categorized as obese is around 40%. I believe only around half of them are going to have access to the financial requirements to buy the drug. So perhaps 20% get access to this drug. The problem with it is you need to do it every week for life. If you stop taking the drug at any point, 
the studies have all shown you do revert back to your normal size. So your behavior may or may not have changed at that point, but maybe you assume half of those stay on the treatment. So you've got a sort of 10% of those people, 10% of the entire US population, essentially, in a bull case for the GLP-1 sellers taking the drug. What proportion does that cut down their consumption of Coca-Cola beverages? Perhaps they stop drinking full-fat Coke, but what if they switch to Diet Coke? Or what if they cut out half their drinks? I think a fair stab in a most bearish scenario for a business like Coca-Cola would be that it's around a 50% oil in consumption of any Coca-Cola product. We've got to get away from just thinking about red Coke. That's like a 5% potential hit to volumes. And so there's a lot of error ranges around that maths. But whatever we do know is it's going to take a huge number of years to take place. And volumes have been growing at 2 3 4% a year pretty consistently for the last 30 years. So you should be able to offset the actual threat relatively easily over the next few years. Fascinating way to kind of think about contextualizing the risks or the impact on the business. Our customary question in concluding these conversations is lessons that can be applied from your study of the Coca-Cola company towards other potential investments. And then from a strategic perspective, how operators change in the context of this. I think in a way it's reinforced a large number of things we've learned elsewhere as well. I think the first thing and what might have put people off the business is that the financial analysis alone for the last five years, possibly the last 15 years, doesn't paint an accurate picture of value creation for this business. It takes a deeper understanding of how the system evolved because when you sell a bottling asset, the, the Coca-Cola company sales fall because they only get a revenue share as a franchise fee as opposed to the full wholesale price. This is something we implement a lot and I think all good investors do, but looking purely at the numbers can miss value creation. It can also very dangerously mask where value is actually being destroyed. And so I think this is probably one of the best examples we've come across in the last five or 10 years where you really had to rely on qualitative analysis in order to get to the core of your thesis to understand how to make any kind of forecast for the future. We've talked about the competitive advantages, but I think within the network effect, competitive advantage kind of set, I think the ones that have that direct distribution, I can also think of a number of network businesses which don't have that direct customer distribution. That does add another ring to the moat around the network business. So that's a really key subtlety to highlight within that. It's this concept of franchising and this concept of this moving from a capital light center to a fixed capital intensive periphery. It doesn't work long term if it's purely financial engineering. It doesn't work at all if it's financial engineering. It can work for 10 years. It can work if interest rates costs fall. It can work if you really cut your costs up. You've done the division, but that probably erodes value because you're not investing in the future durability of your business. It only works if there's genuinely a symbiotic relationship between those two interdependent entities. And that's no clearer than if you read the old annual reports from the sort of 80s and 90s for Coca-Cola, how bad it was when it wasn't working. And I think there's a lot of business models that have employed that route over the last 10 to 15 years that could really, really struggle in an era of higher interest rates, higher inflation, et cetera. So I think that's a really key one. And the final one, which I think is most true for consumer companies, but it's becoming ever true for technology companies too, is that our kind of version of capitalism really does tend towards organic monopolies. And market leading positions can continue to catapult businesses for decades and decades beyond. And you don't need to fade returns of great businesses who are investing behind their brands, their distribution, and their other competitive advantages. I think you could have read any annual report going back 50 years and Coke would have been the dominant player and people would have been pushing back on the thesis that it can continue to grow. But there's a lot of room to grow for this business, both from creating new consumers, taking value share and growing in other categories. So it's proven itself to do so. And it's a great reason to believe other franchises want to analyze this could do the same. I'm glad you chose to highlight the potential arbitrage that other businesses are trying to create and moving from capital heavy to capital light. I think there are a number of businesses who unfortunately are going to be on the shorter end of that stick in that there is not that symbiotic relationship. And I think of franchisees and QSR concepts where 
the unit economics and the absence of sale leasebacks may no longer work. But when it does work, there's tons of value created and capital kind of finds its way towards the highest return opportunity. Coca-Cola being a great example of that. I couldn't go an hour speaking about the Coca-Cola company without recognizing that you're in good company with Berkshire Hathaway at the top of the cap stack. But a wonderful business, an interesting case study. The next couple of years are going to be interesting in the threats to the business. And we look forward to watching along with you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 